Good morning from Los Angeles. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer in New York. Right now on Morning News Now, Mother Nature's Wrath, a winter storm system, is stretching across most of the country. From snow in the upper Midwest to tornadoes in the south, the storm has now turned deadly. This was the scene in Louisiana. Two tornadoes were seen merging. Just a couple of the many twisters in the region. Some this morning now waking up to total devastation. I just thought it was supposed to be some bad weather coming through. There was just a lot of rain and wind. Wasn't expecting no tornado. It's devastating. Like I said, it's all material stuff. I ain't worrying about this. This can be replaced. A yeah. yeah, life can't be replaced. We have the latest on the mess left behind and where the storm system is heading next. Taking action, new this morning, the White House is rolling out a new plan hoping to prevent a winter COVID surge. From testing to vaccinations, we've got the new steps that officials hope will control the virus, plus what doctors are bracing for this winter season. Plus, Royal Rift, Prince Harry and Meghan drop the final episodes of their documentary, revealing new information about the tense relationship between Harry and his brother, Prince William, including why Harry says William was screaming at him him in front of the queen. Also this morning, fight to the finish. The World Cup final is now set after France got past underdog Morocco. The French are now looking to win it all against another dominant team, Argentina. We're in Qatar with a look ahead to Sunday's final. I think we know how many people are going to be spending their Sunday. We're going oh, to yeah. begin <laughs> this hour with the severe winter storm that has been sweeping through the country. Yeah, people in several southern states are waking up this morning to destruction caused by dozens of tornadoes touching down there. These are part of that massive, slow-moving storm that's been making its way across the country. Louisiana was hit hard, and rescue efforts are underway this morning. Our coverage begins with NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas in Killian, Louisiana. Guad, good morning. Savannah, good morning. You can see the destruction here in uh, Kelowna. This is uh, what was left of these homes uh, in this neighborhood. We arrived overnight and uh, met one of the neighbors here as he arrived to find his home completely destroyed. He told us he ran an errand an hour before the tornado hit, and that might have saved his life. He also talked about his next-door neighbor, whose home was also destroyed. Uh, last night, he also learned that she's one of the people that died uh, in these tornadoes that have hit the entire region. We also know that Tuesday uh, overnight another woman and her eight-year-old son died as this wave of destruction has made its way through the region. A violent tornado outbreak across the Gulf Coast. Three straight nights of dangerous and deadly weather. Louisiana pummeled Wednesday. Tornadoes reported all across the state leaving a trail of damage in the New Orleans metropolitan area overnight, homes in complete ruin, and even this car flipped over in the middle of all the rubble. In Kelowna, just east of New Orleans, local authorities say the damage left one dead and at least seven injured. The victim's daughter, speaking to her affiliate WDSU, remembering her kindness. She means the world to me, and if anybody knew her and knew my mama, they know that she would give anybody to close off her back. Lamar Marshall told us he lost almost everything. That's, that's my house. That, that so your upside house, down. That, that upside down. Your house was here before? It was right here. And it is what, like 30 feet over in that direction now? My car was parked straight in the yard. In New Iberia, Louisiana, not one but two tornadoes merging together. The result, neighborhoods left devastated. This my house right here, y'all. My house is just gone. And this hospital left decimated. <laughs> Windows completely blown out and debris blocking the entrance. For those who've lost their homes, the consolation they've escaped unharmed. My neighbor lost her life. So, like I said, this material stuff it can all be replaced. Uh, you can't replace a life. Just an overwhelming number of tornadoes, as re we reported on this yesterday. We, we looked at the map, and the reports were all over the place. Uh, 26 tornado reports in the last 24 hours, uh, some of these coming uh, overnight, which, of course, makes them more deadly because you cannot see them. And even during the day, some of the tornadoes that were reported came with rain, which also makes it very difficult to identify them as the storm continues making its way east, Joe. All right, Quad, thank you so much. 
Let's look at the northern part of this storm system. Millions of people are digging their way through mountains of snow after several states were hit with blizzard-like conditions. Parts of South Dakota saw at least two feet of snow. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is in Duluth, Minnesota with the latest. The snowfall is just going to be epic in Duluth. Over the last 36 hours, we've had nearly 20 inches of snow. That's going to make this one of the largest snowstorms in Duluth history. And this is a city that's used to snow. The wind here has been blowing sideways upwards of 30 miles an hour. That's creating pretty bad whiteout conditions across this area. You can see over my shoulder here, some of the snowfall has been pushed. This is just from the last several days out here, and that mound will continue to grow. We're also seeing chunks of ice, big blocks like this that are go blowing across the area. That's created some havoc across the road. It's not just in Minnesota. In the Dakotas and Wyoming, there's been spin outs and rollovers. Some truck drivers say they've been stuck on the side of the road for more than 30 hours, saying that's the longest time period they've ever been stranded. Those terrible conditions on the road are expected to last for another couple of hours. In fact, here in Duluth, we're expecting upwards of six more inches of snow throughout the day. These blizzard conditions will remain in effect until 6 p.m. today. It's just going to be an awful storm. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you. And let's stay on this as this system is still slowly making its way east. Yeah, and get the latest from meteorologist Angie Lastman. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Miguel looks cold there, and it's bitter cold in places that have seen this system already work through. And we'll start to get the cold working into the east as well. But first, we've got to deal with more wintry weather for the location that Miguel was at in the upper Midwest. Also, the northeast and mid-Atlantic states. You're going to start to get in on this action as well. And we still have severe weather potential in parts of the south. As far as the wintry weather is concerned, this is really causing problems for the early morning commute in many locations. We have a mix of freezing rain, some sleet, some rain working in there, and we'll eventually have some snow, too, here for parts of western uh, New York and western Pennsylvania. That's where we're going to start to see some of that uh, accumulating snow. Now, other locations, the icing is going to be an issue. We've already seen those watches and warnings up for, for days now, and the winter alerts are still in effect for 13 million in parts of those northern plains and parts of the Midwest. Miguel showing you just how much snow they've received there. And again, more than 18 inches as of 4 a.m. for Duluth. So no surprise if travel trouble is happening in that area. We'll also see the travel trouble that I mentioned in parts of the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. That's where we have 32 million under winter alerts. What you're seeing in the bright purple there is the ice storm warning. And that's a concerning situation for folks there. Again, heading out onto the roads early this morning or even into late this afternoon as we head out for that afternoon commute and then even into tomorrow morning. So here's the ice forecast. Here's how much accumulation we're expecting. I think widespread, it'll be closer to a tenth of an inch. Uh, as we get closer to you know places in western Pennsylvania, we could see a quarter of an inch of ice. That means down tree, um, down tree limbs, power lines are going to be an issue. And by the way, hundreds of thousands of people are out of power in places in the Midwest. So that's setting us up for what we can possibly expect in parts of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. The snowfall, again, Again, I think if you're along the coast and you're worried about the rest of the day today or even into tomorrow as far as snow is concerned, not quite as likely. You're going to see more of the rain falling in Boston, New York, and down through Washington, D.C., but that doesn't mean that you won't have a mix of that, that wintry mix here before we start to see it transition over into rain. So just be prepared for that. You might see a couple of flakes there uh, and still some rough conditions out on those roads. As far as the snowfall totals are concerned, kind of impressive as we look inland, but that's more the interior area, so be ready for that. We also have that tornado watch that is still in effect for parts of Georgia and Florida along the Big Bend area. That's the bullseye for where we're going to watch for the potential for tornadoes over the next hour. That is set to expire at 9 a.m. Beyond that, though, 11 million still at a risk for severe weather here in Florida, Georgia, and up into the Carolinas, South Carolina to be specific. And that means not just the tornado threat, but also the gusty winds and the hail will be something to watch today. Something to watch all up and down the coast. All right, Angie, thank you so much. Thanks. Let's get to the latest on the economy now. And that decision by the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates by another half a percent. It comes on the heels of a better than expected inflation report for November. And as more signs emerge of a slowing economy. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Tom Costello with more on this. Tom, good morning. Mr. Fryer, good morning to you. So, you know, the Fed has telegraphed very clearly what its intentions are. So this half point rate hike, this was expected. It was widely anticipated and it was baked in, as they say. 
But what's interesting here is the Fed is also saying that going forward in 2023, more rate hikes to come. From factory floors to farms to Main Street USA, every interest rate hike ripples through the economy, affecting everyday Americans. Near Philly, small business Eric and Christopher makes silkscreen pillows and totes. They'd like to expand, but higher rates are making a small business loan too expensive, just as inflation drives up costs, forcing them to cut employee hours. It's kind of a scary time. I can't pursue ideas and dreams, if you will, to, to grow the business to, to other levels, to other avenues, to other outlets at this time. The Fed's decision today to hike interest rates by another half point could put those dreams even further out of reach. This seventh interest rate hike of the year comes as inflation appears to be slowing, running at 7.1% year over year. Better than the 9.1% last June, but still too high. We understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell today saying the Fed will keep raising rates through the new year, making credit cards and new loans more expensive, affecting mortgages and likely pushing up unemployment. I wish there were a completely painless way to restore price stability. There isn't, and uh, this is the best we can do. While gas prices have dropped, food and rent prices are still too high. The Fed is going further, and even though there's been two better-than-expected inflation reports, the Fed still feels like it has a lot more work to do. All right, a lot more work to do. The Fed wants to bring inflation down from 7% right now down to 2%. So you can see it's got a lot of work to do. And Joe, as we've talked about many times, it really only has one tool, hiking interest rates, the best way to bring inflation down. The problem is it likely will mean higher unemployment in the months ahead. All right, Tom, breaking it down for us. We appreciate that. Thank you. You bet. And turning now to the quadruple homicide in Idaho, frustrations are mounting as police are still searching for answers in the murders of four students, with the family of one of the victims now speaking out. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from Moscow, Idaho, with the very latest. Hey, Aaron, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. Christy Gonzalez says she's speaking out out of frustration with the way authorities are handling information about her daughter's murder, including the news that they're looking for a white Hyundai seen in this area at the time of the murder. She sh says she's terrified this case could go cold. It's sleepless nights. It's feeling sick to your stomach. It's just being left in the dark. Kaylee Gonzalez's mother recounting the chaos on the day she found out her daughter and Kaylee's best friend Maddie were killed, along with Zana Kernodal and Ethan Chapin. There was there's nothing you could do. Absolutely nothing. Just we were running around for hours, just not knowing what was going on, what happened, because we found out by people calling us. And the sheriff showed up about three hours later. When you saw the sheriff, did you know? Yes. And I had said that. I said, it's not real until the sheriff pulls up. Gonzalva says she and her family support the police and the work investigators are doing. But they're critical of authorities for what they called poor communication with victims' families. You found out about the white car from a press release? Yes. Yes. Did they send you the press release? No. This morning, new clues related to that white Hyundai. Fox News Digital reporting this new surveillance photo from a gas station, showing what appears to be a white car driving at 3.45 a.m. on the night of the murders. Meantime, Gonsalves also told me the county coroner called and told her 17-year-old daughter graphic details from the autopsy over the phone. She asked, are you sure you want to know this? And my daughter thinking that she did for whatever reason, um, said yes, and she proceeded to tell her. And so, and you haven't spoken to the coroner? No. The family says they met with authorities Monday to express their grievances. A Moscow police spokesperson declined to comment on allegations relating to communications with the family. NBC News reached out separately to the coroner, but received no comment. This morning, eight days into the search for the white Hyundai Elantra, Gonsalves says it's becoming harder to remain optimistic. Are you confident the police are going to solve this crime? I have to be. 
The Gonsalves family says they're speaking out on behalf of Maddie as well. Maddie's family is too grief stricken to speak. Maddie was their only child. Maddie and Kaylee, they say, were best friends. Back to you. All right, just heartbreaking. Still so many questions. Aaron, thank you so much. Now to the war in Ukraine and the incredible story of a former UPS driver who is inside the war zone, at times the only person willing to rush in and help carry out incredibly dangerous rescues. NBC News correspondent Allison Barber is in Kyiv with the details. Allison, good morning. Hey, Joe, our team has spent a lot of time with this guy, Brad Hendrickson. I think I speak for myself, uh, producer Dan Gallo and photographer David Gladstone, when I say Brad will hate that people are calling him a hero after seeing this. But that is exactly what he is. Watch. The two primary uh, jobs are delivering aid and then evacuating people out. He'll tell you he's just... Brad from the States, a guy who's had a lot of jobs, some with emergency medical training. But most recently, he was a UPS truck driver in Maine. Now he's driving routes few would dare to take. Under bombardment at times. And alone. I'm sort of the last mile guy in a lot of different places. Roughly speaking, do you have a sense of how many evacuations you've done since you've been here? Dozens and dozens and dozens. Uh, sh surely more than 100. It, I, I'm bad at counting. Hey, buddy. <laughs> All of these videos are Brad's. Probably went up and over that thing. Snapshots of a humanitarian mission few back home could imagine. I've just gotten a call about a wounded person next door to an evacuation that happened recently. This Hello? was Brad's Thanksgiving. Hello? <laughs> At nightfall, a call came from Eastern Bakhmut. He was about to begin one of his most daring rescues. Hello. 69-year-old oh. oh. Tatiana Letterkova was desperately trying to save her husband, Valentin, who was injured in an explosion. Oh. She tried to stop the bleeding with tourniquets and go, kitchen we rats. We, doctor, we have to go to a doctor now. Brad tried carrying Valentin on his back, but couldn't do it alone. Oh. Oh. Boy, boy. So he pulled him down every step to the temporary safety of his Toyota Land Cruiser. Boy. Finally, after a harrowing drive, they made it to a hospital. There was little time to spare. Tatiana is in Western Ukraine. The memories of that night still haunt her, except for one. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a voice on the street. Hey, 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 a yell. Her husband of 48 years is alive. And she says it's only because of Brad. He is an unreal human, unreal. He is just an angel. I'm serious. It is impossible for a person. It is impossible for an ordinary person. I just thought that an angel had come. Brad is still in eastern Ukraine. Did you expect to be here as long as you no. have been? <laughs> no, I, I did not. Um, no, I thought I probably would have already been, been back by now. And he says he's not going anywhere. There are a lot of people who come in and go back out. Yeah, I feel on the hook. I mean, I just, I just, I, I keep looking at the need, I keep looking at the grief, I keep looking at the freezing cold and the emaciated animals and the medical injuries and on and on and on. Brad is carrying out most of his rescues in the city of Bakhmut. That is where some of the fiercest battles have been taking place. Before the war, about 71,000 people lived in that city now. The regional governor says it is less than 10,000. And just five days ago, Joe, President Zelensky described this city as burnt ruins. Joe? Brad may not want to be called a hero, but Ellison, I'm going to echo what you and your team said. He most definitely is. Extraordinary reporting. Thank you for that. 
coming up on Morning News Now. The World Cup final is set. France will take on Argentina this Sunday. We have the latest from Doha next with what to expect from these teams. Plus, an incredible rescue at sea. Two boaters missing for 10 days are found hundreds of miles from home. Their story of survival next. We're back now with the latest from the World Cup, starting with France's 2-0 victory over Morocco. The defending champions ended the Moroccan Cinderella run and will now face off against Argentina in the finals on Sunday in what's setting up to be a clash of two soccer heavyweights. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has the latest from Qatar. What an incredible game. Morocco came out with this fighting spirit. They sustained that throughout the entire game. Now, France did score a goal about four minutes in, but it didn't seem to shake the confidence of the Moroccan team. They had multiple attempts on goal. They just couldn't connect with the back of the net. Then about 80 minutes into the game, that's when France secured their spot in the finals with another goal, 2-0 victory over Morocco. France now heading to the World Cup final. Take a listen to what fans had to say on both sides. No one, no one thought we could do this. No one thought Morocco had the ability to do this. So uh, to see just all the Arab world come together as well, I think that's been the best part. Um, no one thought we'd come this far. So. How do you feel right now that you guys pulled off this win? Yes, it was a very nice play of games. The Morocco deserved to this way. I respect it. Very nice to play with the heart. But we enjoy to have the fans in final. And we think we kill the Hatina. Come on, come on. Now the finals kick off 10 a.m. Eastern on Sunday. France squaring off against Argentina. Just back to you. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Let's bring in Sam Stasekel, a senior writer at The Athletic, to break down the latest from the World Cup. Sam, good morning. Good to have you with us. Obviously, a lot of excitement for France there, but they did end Morocco's run yesterday. Not before, though, they became the first country from Africa to get this far in a World Cup. Walk us through just how special that moment was. Yeah, it was huge. Um, as you mentioned, the first African team to make it to a World Cup semifinal, uh, the first team from the Arab world to make it to a World Cup semifinal, and they did so, of course, in a Middle Eastern country. So that was special. You know, I'm back in New York now, but being on the ground in Doha, the Moroccan fans were, it was an enormous presence. And they were there a full week before the tournament even kicked off. They were loud, they were noisy, they were passionate. Uh, it bled through into the stands, of course. Um, and a really excellent, and built around a, a wonderful defensive performance. Um, they actually didn't allow the other team to score a goal until the semifinals. They gave up an own goal in the group stage against Canada. But other than that, it was all shutouts until the France game. So a really excellent run for Morocco and something mm -hmm. that that country should be very proud of for generations, really. Oh, absolutely. And now, Sam, I mean, we have these two soccer heavyweights facing off against each other, France and Argentina. What are some storylines that you're going to be watching as that game approaches? Yeah, so the main one for me is, is about Lionel Messi, uh, arguably the greatest player of all time towards the end of his career. He's now 35. He said this will be his last World Cup. He's searching for his first World Cup. It's basically the only thing that he has not won in his legendary career. So that that's that's top of mind for sure. But France has plenty to play for, too. They could become the first back-to-back -back World Cup champion since 1962 when Brazil pulled it off. So that would obviously be a, a tremendous achievement if they were able to do it. Kylian Mbappe is their star player, uh, just 23 years old. He already has a World Cup title to his name. He was one of the stars of the 2018 tournament in Russia. Um, he's got nine goals in his World Cup career already. The record is 16 all time and he's just 23 so if he keeps on going at the pace he's at he'll break that with ease um so two of two of the greatest stars of the of the modern game of the current era Messi maybe passing the torch to Mbappe to kind of carry it through for the next decade plus um that'll be a major thing to watch on Sunday as well wow. Just 23 years old. I think that makes a lot of us feel like we haven't accomplished very much in our years now, have we? Um, <laughs> Sam, you mentioned <laughs> Messi, and, and obviously we already know how much of a superstar he is in the soccer world. But if he were to deliver a win here, I mean, just how much of an impact do you think that that has on his legacy? Yeah, I mean, I think it just makes it, it cements everything. It makes it inarguable. It's the only knock that he has in his career is that he, he has not won a World Cup. Argentina made it to the final in 2014. They lost an extra time to Germany. Messi was named player of the tournament in that World Cup. 
Um, but this tournament, he's been arguably at his best, and he's doing it at age 35. Uh, he's got five goals, four assists, um, top the Golden Boot rankings um, given to the top scorer. He, he will win player of the tournament almost assuredly, no matter what happens on Sunday. And, and, and this would just remove all that, for me anyway, uh, for him as mm. the best player of all time. Um, I think he's already there. But I think this would uh, this the scales in his favor with a lot of other folks around the world too. Lots to watch for here. Sam Stays cool. We know what most people will probably be doing on Sunday, and certainly you. Thanks for reporting on it all for us. <laughs> Thanks so much. Now to an amazing rescue at sea, more than 200 miles off Delaware's coast. Two men from New Jersey and their dog, stranded in a sailboat for more than a week, were saved by a Dutch tanker and its crew, all thanks to a chance encounter. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with this. I think incredible is an understatement. For yeah, one. it certainly is, Joe. The name of the boat, the Atrevita 2. And uh, Atrevita in, in English means daring, and that's exactly <laughs> what these sailors needed for this particular adventure. You know, they were lost at sea for days. They had little food, little water. They had that dog on their hands until this Dutch tanker spotted them, saved the day, the men, and the poodle. <laughs> this morning, two sailors are thankful to be alive after a miracle rescue that saved them and a pet poodle, all lost at sea for more than a week. It's a miracle, right? It's Christmas. 65-year-old Kevin Hyde, a lifelong sailor, invited his 76-year-old friend, Joe DiDomaso, and his poodle, Minnie, on a sailing trip from Cape May, New Jersey, to the Florida Keys. After making a stop in the Outer Banks of North Carolina on December 3rd, without warning, the men say, clear blue skies turned into the worst storm of their lives. I never heard wind so bad in my whole life. They were just... Sound like the devil was out there. 40-foot waves crashed into their vessel, leaving them with no power, no gas, no food, barely any water for 10 days. The rescue effort started after frantic family members called authorities, leading the Coast Guard Sunday on a search by air and sea that spanned more than 20,000 square miles. Finally, on Tuesday, a crew member from an international cargo ship spotted the boat 200 miles off the coast of Delaware. He came around and he picked us up. It was amazing. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Spotting them was one miracle. Actually, getting them on board the massive oil tanker was another. An intense effort that took three hours. This cell phone video captured the crew using a cargo net to rescue the weary boaters. The captain of the ship calling the rescue a divine intervention. God sent our Silver Moon ship to save them. <laughs> yeah, you, just, you don't just jump onto an oil tanker. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 <laughs> Take yeah, yeah. some work. But you can tell those guys <laughs> are in good health, and now they have this... Whale of a tail for their holiday table and no one, their poodle. And no one better to hear it from than them because they are just straight out of central casting. Salty, so. salty sailors. <laughs> yep. Stephanie, thanks for that story. You're Appreciate welcome. it. We're back now with a declassified House report that is shedding new light on how much U.S. intelligence agents knew about the COVID pandemic before it reached the U.S. And while documents show international spies alerted the U.S. about COVID just weeks after the Wuhan outbreak, they failed to quickly gather information from China, and that delayed any possible response from lawmakers. NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney joined us now with a closer look. Ken, good morning. So first of all, why did these spies struggle to get information about the COVID pandemic, and then how how did that impact policies the White House put into place really during the height of it? Good morning, Joe. Well, this report really has three main conclusions. One, it does say that the spy agencies did, using public sources, they did call it early on that this novel coronavirus emerging from China was going to become a global pandemic. And they warned the White House about that. And Donald Trump clearly misled the public about what he was hearing at the time. But then what the report says is the intelligence community failed to pivot and was unable to start spying on Chinese officials and ferreting out what, what White House officials needed to know in the early days about human-to-human -human transmission and about what the Chinese weren't saying. They weren't intercepting Chinese communications. They weren't coming up with the kind of information we expect the intelligence community to get, stealing secrets, in order to help inform policymakers. And so that meant that the response in the United States was delayed. I mean, there are other reasons for the delays. Donald Trump clearly didn't want to come to grips with this 
pandemic. But they, they didn't put in the social distancing, the mask wearing as early as they might have had they been armed with that information. And the report also says that the intelligence community is still not ready for the next pandemic, Joe. I want to ask you more about the Trump response. I mean, these spy agencies warned the Trump White House of a looming COVID threat well before the World Health Organization even declared the virus a global pandemic. But as you mentioned, then President Trump really downplayed the seriousness of COVID. Does this report say anything about his role in this? Yeah, absolutely. So we know from the Bob Woodward's reporting, you know, he had those tape recorded interviews with Donald Trump that Trump acknowledged that he downplayed the seriousness of the virus. What this report shows is that it wasn't just the CDC and his health advisors that were telling him, it was the intelligence community. They were briefing the White House and Donald Trump and saying as, as early as January 2020 and well into February, they were issuing dire warnings about the potential for COVID-19 to become a global pandemic and kill Americans. And Donald Trump Trump was telling the world that there was nothing to worry about. And on January 30th, he said, oh, there's only five cases here in the United States and, and we're going to take care of this thing. And then later, when he was asked about his intelligence warnings, he said that intelligence officials were speaking about the virus in a very ma matter of fact manner. This report, which looked deeply into the intelligence response, completely blows that out of the water, Joe. This report also points out that spy agencies just may not be equipped to handle future pandemics. Why is that? Um, the report identifies a cultural problem within some of these agencies that they just don't see bio threats as a top tier national security threat, even though this pandemic killed a million Americans. And Adam Schiff, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, pointed out to me that if a terrorist attack killed a million Americans, you know, this I would transform national culture. But these spy agencies still don't aren't geared up for the next pandemic to sort of train their esoteric spying capabilities, including communications intercepts and satellites onto the kind of health information that policymakers need. It's an ongoing struggle. The Biden administration is trying to turn the aircraft carrier, but there is cultural resistance, Joe. All right, Ken Delaney and Ken, thank you. You bet. And out of the major health concerns over the so-called triple-demic, we're continuing to see a rise in cases of the flu, RSV, and COVID heading into the holiday season, and resources at hospitals are stretched thin. This morning, the White House is taking action, announcing the rollout of its winter COVID-19 preparedness plan, which includes the return of its free at-home test program. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Uche Blackstock joins us on this now. Dr. Blackstock, it is always great to have you with us. So first, just tell us some of the highlights of this plan and how they're going to help our COVID battle heading into the holiday season. Great. Good morning, Savannah. Thank you so much for having me. So one of the big points of this plan is that they are restarting, as you mentioned, the at-home COVID test. And, and, and these are the tests that people are, have been using uh, to test themselves if they are symptomatic or may have been exposed. This is why we, we typically are seeing an undercount of the cases, but it's also so important as people are taking the personal responsibility um, and getting tested. We're also seeing an increase in free vaccination sites, so in, in, so certainly in communities that need them most. We're seeing more people, even military, being recruited and clinical personnel being recruited to help at hospitals or clinical sites because we're seeing those increase in hospitalizations. And so, you know, all of this is incredibly uh, important to making sure that people have the resources and supplies. Another thing I saw on the response was that they're having increased access to N95 masks. So we know those masks are very important, those high quality masks to preventing transmission of the virus as well. You know, doctor, I think this comes at a time that a lot of us are feeling a sense of pandemic fatigue or almost feeling sort of confused because the rules around them where they live kind of make it seem like, hey, maybe it's not that much of a threat right now. But we know we're also seeing a low uptake for the bivalent booster. And then all these COVID precautions and restrictions have been lifted. So what do you recommend people do to keep safe during these winter months, especially, of course, during the upcoming holiday season when there's so many family, friends getting together, lots of older, younger people all in the same room? What's your advice here? Right. And so I understand people feel like they're getting contradictory messaging. But the fact is, as you said, cases are going up, hospitalizations going up. So staying protected is incredibly important. So again, you know, masking in indoor places, is not only effective for COVID-19, but also for RSV and flu. Washing your hands is very effective for preventing the transmission of both flu and RSV. You know, um, testing yourself if you're sick or if you've been exposed. And also making sure to Plan around the most vulnerable people in your family, the elderly or the immunocompromised, making sure to keep them safe. 
if you're going to be indoors, make sure there's an air purifier or open windows or it's a ventilated area. And then just be making sure that you are up to date with your vaccinations. There is that you know, bivalent booster that is available and it's not too late for people to get them. So I recommend everyone to go out and get it if you have not had your vaccination in the last two months. So, Doctor, actually, a question about those boosters, because a new study says that the Omicron subvariants pre prevent a serious threat to the effectiveness of these new boosters. It says that they render antibody treatments ineffective and could cause a surge of breakthrough infections. What do we need to know about this? And for anyone who hears what I just said, maybe reads a study like that themselves and thinks, well, right. should I be getting this if it seems like infections are getting around it anyway? What would you say? Right. No, absolutely. I, we, people should still get the booster, even though this, um, you know, the updated booster may not be as effective at preventing infection. Uh, it is, they are still very effective at preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. And so that is why right now um, the, this updated booster is authorized for anyone who's six months or older. And so you can go to vaccines.gov to find the closest vaccination site to you. Again, these, these boosters are still very effective against the worst outcomes of COVID-19, including those newer subvariants. All right, Dr. Uche Blackstock, always great advice for us, especially as we all head home for holidays. Thank Thanks you. so much. Overnight, Netflix released the three final episodes of Prince Harry and Meghan's docuseries. In them, Harry's account of an angry meeting with his brother while Meghan talks about her most difficult moments. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now from Buckingham Palace. Hey, Keir. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. This morning, the royal palaces are not commenting on this latest Netflix release. And perhaps that's not surprising when you think of everything that Harry knows about what has happened behind those palace walls. There is so much that he hasn't said. But goodness me, what he has to say about his brother, you have to wonder what William is thinking this morning. Three more episodes begin with the fairy tale wedding at Windsor Castle. Then detail a descent into increasingly negative headlines, palace tensions, and the Duke of Sussex describing in the strongest ever terms the breakdown with his brother. He says there was a furious row at a family summit. It was terrifying to have my brother um, scream and shout at me and my father say things that just simply weren't true and, and my grandmother, you know, quietly sit there and, and sort of take it all in. Prince Harry says he was blocked from seeing the Queen alone. The saddest part of it was this wedge created between myself and my brother so that he's now on the institution side. And he accuses his brother's press officials of briefing the media against him and his wife. The palace even publishing a statement on behalf of both brothers, he says, that he did not approve. They're happy to lie to protect my brother. And yet, for three years, they were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. We watched with broadcaster Afia Hogan and royal author Katie Nichol. This, I think, really busts open in a, in a very dramatic and damaging way is the, how, how awful relations were and, and continue to be between the two brothers. This is a good old-fashioned fallout between two brothers and I actually think less so their wives and their wives have been dragged into it. Critical press coverage, the couple say, led the Duchess of Sussex to question her life. All of this will stop if I'm not here. For the first time, her mum and husband talk about that period. I remember her telling me that, that she had wanted to take her own life. It's, that's not an easy one for a mom to hear. And uh... I didn't deal with it particularly well. I dealt with it as institutional Harry as opposed to husband Harry. And looking back on it now, I, I, I hate myself for it. But it is Harry and William's clearly broken relationship that will leave lingering questions. The well, day after the Oprah interview, we see him receiving a text from Prince William. Wow. He's just going to text him. Yeah, he's just going to text his brother. We're not told what it said. 
And Harry and Meghan's main target continues to be the media and the press, guys. There is a, a heartbreaking segment where Meghan talks about having a miscarriage during her legal battle with the Daily Mail, which she won. That battle about a letter, a private letter that was printed by the Mail from Meghan uh, to her father. Prince Harry talks about the stress that they were under at that time. He says, admittedly, that you can't necessarily say that the miscarriage was due to all of that, but he does clearly point the finger. He also says that they plan to move on, but you really are left wondering how they're going to do that, guys. Sounds like a lot to digest in these three episodes. Kira, thank you so much. And now let's get to some financial headlines. Twitter has suspended the account made famous for tracking Elon Musk's private jet. CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. So Twitter has permanently suspended the account that tracked the location of owner Elon Musk's private jet. Musk citing new company policy says any account doxing real-time location of anyone will be suspended as it's a safety violation. Just last month, Musk promised he would leave the at Elon Jet account up as part of his commitment to free speech. The account run by a 20-year-old college student had more than 500,000 followers. The new CEO of FTX, John Ray, has been brought in to work on the restructuring of the failed crypto exchange. He has helped oversee bankruptcies at several large companies, most notably Enron. He's also getting paid for his work to the tune of $1,300 an hour, according to court filings. Ray and his team are not like typical employees who work directly for a company. Instead, they're independent contractors who get paid immediately before any FTX investor will be repaid for their losses. Company holidays are making a comeback. A survey by staffing firm Challenger Gray and Christmas finds more than 57% of companies are planning an in-person party this year. That's still down from the 75% that threw a party in 2019, but way up from 26% last year and 5% in 2020. However, many gatherings will be smaller as employers try to accommodate people who are still working remotely, guys. All right. Love to see it. A little holiday cheer. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, coming up, proof that you can live out your dreams at any age. Yeah, we're going to introduce you to a dancer who's made a name for herself on TikTok, how she's inspiring others beyond her videos and flipping the script. Next. Welcome back. Two influential films for Latinos have been inducted into the National Film Registry. Cyrano de Bergerac from back in 1950 starred Jose Ferrer, who became the first Latino to win a Best Actor Academy Award for his performance in the movie. And 1982's The Ballad of Gregorio Cortez was based on actual events and adapts an early 1900s Mexican ballad. The National Film Preservation Board selects 25 films each year based on their cultural and historical historical contributions and Latinos have traditionally been underrepresented in Hollywood so of course recognizing films like these is helping to change that and making a real impact. Yeah so important to recognize that history. Thanks Savannah. Now to our series Flipping the Script featuring people on screen on stage and behind the scenes who are shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter Kim Hale. The lifelong dancer has more than 450,000 followers on TikTok but in her mid-50s She's far from your average influencer, and her career in dance has been anything but traditional. Now she's inspiring others and proving that you're only as old as you feel. Is it fair to say your dancing journey has been a little unusual? Yes, definitely, 100%. Um, I like to say it has been anything but linear. And like any good dance, Kim Hale's path has been full of tempo changes. From dancing on a cruise ship to a career as a public relations specialist to life as a dance teacher. Lots of stops and starts along the way, but I'm back. How does it feel to be back? It feels good. It feels good to be living authentically and doing what I love. While Hale loves to dance, her career struggled to take off in her 20s. I lived in New York. I wanted to be on Broadway. That never happens. I got so close so many times. Two people, three people, but just wasn't in my destiny yet. So Broadway, if you're out there, I'm here. <laughs> she kept teaching dance, but stopped dancing herself until 2020, when she found herself, like so many others, stuck inside. Every stage in life can be an adventure. 
You don't have to be defined. If you didn't make it in your 20s, you can make it in your 30s. And, you and this voice inside me said, it's time to get back to dance. And I thought, wow, really? With my white hair? But it was truly about just finding something that you love. You post videos on social media. What's been the reaction? Well, for the first reaction was, get it, Granny. And I was like, really? Get it, Granny? I am nobody's grandmother. That's Granny Hale, y'all. Oh, no. But it led me to kind of creating a platform that's about reimagining what's possible at every age. And that platform has led to millions of likes on TikTok, as well as appearances on talk shows like Ellen and The Late Late Show with James Corden. Her career also includes choreographer positions on Scandal and the Netflix holiday musical Christmas on the Square, starring Dolly Parton. I will say I get DMs every day. I get people that write comments on my Post just saying that they're inspired to do something that they've always wanted to do. I get young people who say, I want to be you. And I say, why are you waiting? Do it now. What? Why wait? I denied myself what I love for so long because I thought I had to look a certain way, that I had to be a certain way, and that maybe I wasn't who I was in my 20s. Thank God. <laughs> but now it's all about just redefining who I am as a 54-year-old, soon to be 55-year-old woman. So here you are on the brink of 55 years old. What's the goal? The goal is to be happy, to stay connected to the joy and love in my life. I think dance for me is like a metaphor of living life to the fullest, not getting stuck into stereotypes of who I should be, what I should be, and just, um, again, expanding the narrative of what's possible. As for what's next for Kim, she says she just shot her very first commercial, so keep a lookout for her while you're watching TV. And, of course, you can check out all her moves right now on TikTok and Instagram. How inspiring is that? <laughs> that does it for Amazing. this hour of Morning News Now. Great interview, Joe. But the news continues right now. Stick with us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.